In other words, being educationally insolvent, not offering required courses. If you look worse, 50% of the districts, and this is a scary, scary fact, because those fund balances are being spent down. And all of a sudden, we're starting to enter uncharted waters. I asked a BOCES superintendent, and I asked a school business official, who has to remain somewhat nameless, what's going to happen? And the response from both of them is, we don't know. We are entering uncharted territory. What they did tell me is they could sue the state of New York for the balance that they were missing and have a chance of winning because the state has to provide an equal opportunity for education for kids between 5 and 21 years old. And if it's not an equal education, then there's a problem. But start to look at that. My wife made me put flower pictures in. I give a lot of information very quickly. If there are any questions on some of this stuff, I'm used to doing much longer, two, three, four hour lectures, so the flower pictures are a break. Somebody asked, asked me to the Black Eyed Susans. Uh, I'm the vegetable guy in our family, and she's the flower person in our family, so there's a little crossover. Uh, by the way, always marry somebody smarter than you. <laughs> the present state of New York State, Northern New York Public Schools, fiscal and educational insolvency is imminent in all of our districts. It's not a matter of will, it's a matter of when. Generally, the population of the North Country is declining and the population is aging. St. Lawrence student base has declined by 10,000 students since 1976. State aid varies all over the place. This was a shock to me. On Long Island, there are districts that get less than one half of 1% state aid. Their superintendents say, I never even look at that number. It doesn't matter. All right? In a district, um, it varies, like my district is in the, the, the low 90 percentile for state aid, really dependent upon it. And then uh, I think it was uh, Old Forge has about 10 percent state aid because of all the wealth in that area from the summer residents. All right, approximately 78 percent of the budget in any given district is for staff-related expenses. You tend to fix those as in your mind a fixed expense, a fixed cost that you have to deal with the teachers, the retirement teachers, the health care, the benefits, the perks, etc. So if you're looking to be sustainable, wow, dropping teacher population means dropping programs makes the school sustainable, but it's now educationally insolvent. All right? 3% for heating and lighting, 7% for transportation, 10% for debt service, and the 2% for miscellaneous expenses, maintenance, staff supplies, et cetera. Start to look at those numbers because you go from what you think is a fixed cost to a variable cost. Can we cut benefits to teachers, principals, administrators, custodians? Jeez, if we can get rid of those, we'd, we'd start to make some money then. And then again, I'd be hung up by a very short rope on a very tall tree if this was trusted. And also, if you're paying less and providing less benefits, you're going to get less qualified, less dedicated teachers. All right? We look at the heating and lighting, and 3% doesn't sound bad. But you notice what I did to this room. By the way, if we switched over to LED lights and paid the maintenance staff to switch these lights over and bought the LED lights and paid for the electricity, it's $3,000 for this room alone from $5,000. And after that, the cost to run this room per year is about $300, $400 compared to $5,000. All right, start to look at some of the other suggestions. And you're starting to look at using your head rather than going with tradition. 7% uh, for transportation. Um, our buildings were built in an era of cheap federal money to centralize school districts, in the, especially in the 1960s, and cheap fuel costs. So we could bus these kids around, and we've gotten so used to big buildings, big buses, let's just move them all around, that we haven't started to look, is this the best way to teach our kids? All right, debt service? I'm not a believer in debt, but I know how districts put bonds out to do things. I'm becoming, it's by the way, my first year on the school board is just finishing up. I've actually understood what they've discussed at the past two meetings. 
All right, we're stuck with some problems. Um, both the BOCES superintendent and the business manager I talked with says the gap elimination adjustment has removed $75 million from North Country schools. That's just the 18 I mentioned, all right? It's kind of like taking a hit, and then even if it's eliminated, you're never going to catch up. If you ask around how many teachers have left North Country schools in our area, um, we've had 60 positions eliminated in three years in the South Jefferson District. I don't know whether you follow, General Brown is eliminating close to 30 positions next year alone, and General Brown is not a big school district. All of a sudden, you're doing so much, you're like that guy, and again, I'm dating myself here, that used to spin plates on the uh, variety shows. And after a while, you cannot keep spinning the plates on sticks before they start to crash down. And the things that crash down are our educational quality, are the opportunities for our students. All right, North Country schools typically re uh, receive between 65 and 70% state aid. That's, that's pretty normal average, at least with the 18 I'm in with. Foundation aid may, in may increase, but again, it's probably too little, too late. We've already taken the losses. The state education department is not responsible. New York State is responsible for and can be sued for the shortfalls. It has a limited budget too. Those monies will only go so far, so it's gonna be sorry, we can't help you. We are in unexplored territory. What do we do? Oh, somebody will fix it. I don't know who, but we'll work out something. I don't like to be in that category. I'm, I'm a person that likes to look at concrete solutions to things. Well, we could go the next choice. Oh, come on. We could panic. We could try to figure out what to do, throw money at it, increase taxes, ask the tax cap be removed, and a whole lot of stuff, but that's really not gonna do anything. Uh, I'm not one of those guys that writes letters to my congressman. I tend to have real solid, what can be a practical way for solving this problem? All right. One of my favorite authors, R. Buckminster Fuller, has a thing called comprehensive anticipatory design science. We have to look at what we have, look at what could be happening in the future, and rise to the occasion with calm, logical, sensible solutions that will work. Uh, I limited two slides. Uh, thank God for Doug Welch. He looked through my program and said, it's about an hour and a half. We've got to cut it down to 15 minutes. But I had Al Gore and uh, oh. Rush Limbaugh slides. You know, who do you listen to? Oh my gosh, the different things you could get. All right, got to go by what we know. History of oil discovery, history of oil extraction. We are stuck. All right, you could talk about Marcellus shale. It's still not being produced in a quantity that we can actually measure, and the environmental problems are still going to be there. It's new technology. To me, I'd rather rely on this and start to do things that make sense as opposed to exploring whole new areas of technology that we don't know the result's gonna be, and we are depleting our grandchildren's resources to satisfy us right now. It's a heavy slide. <laughs> All right, just the facts, ma'am. It used to be a TV show. Uh, at best, most North Country schools have stabilized population-wise, and most seem to be declining slowly in both population and quality of education. Graduates are not returning to their hometowns because the jobs are not there. The buildings that comprise North Country schools were designed and built in an era of cheap energy and were or not or are not energy efficient. Attempts to, attempts to make them more energy efficient are a bit better than Band-Aids, but not much better and expensive to boot. The ultimate goal for any of our buildings should be net zero energy use. Make them create their own energy. Put the systems on there so that we don't have to do things. And I can get into, oh, believe me, I can get into how to design an energy efficient building where the children heat it. You design it that way and it, you build it tight and vent it right is, the, is how the quote goes. We spend the energy on things like natural gas, fuel oil, and even biofuels. And when you think about it, most of those are the stock components for making insulation. Why not spend it on the insulation? 
If I were to take a new building, it doesn't matter whether it's a residence, a factory, or a school, and you spend 10% more on insulating the building, you reduce the heating and cooling energy cost by over 80%. What this means is instead of a very large steam boiler, you could probably use the equivalent of a home furnace to heat an entire building for students with them in it. In fact, you may have to vent it because every student is 175 BTU per hour furnace. Justifies the uh, school food costs. Uh, <laughs> what can be done? We can continue to make North Country schools more energy efficient. Start with an energy audit. They're free or near free. Don't get just one because you're going to get them put on by a NYSERDA certified auditor. You can get them put on by commercial auditors that work for people like Johnson Controls and, and, and other places that do that. And you can also get independent auditors. All right, Between them all, you'll start to look at some of the things that people don't pay attention to. All right, Phantom load reduction. All right, I was joking at my table. All right, But you don't think of things that are on all the time. Computers that are left on just because the next class might use it. Lights that are left on, or even better, <coughs> screens or curtains that are pulled down and the room lights are left on because we're not letting natural sunlight in. Uh, I made a joke because nobody pays attention to the exit lights. Nobody pays attention to the uh, vending machines. Uh, one district I know eliminated the soda vending machines from their faculty room and gave the teachers free soda when they did the energy audit. The profit that they made on the soda was by an order or two of magnitude eliminated by the cost of energy to run one of the most poorly designed refrigeration units on this planet. The Coke company does not care how efficient that Coke vending machine is. Put uh, a meter on it and you'll be quite surprised. Uh, more efficient lighting, heating systems, variable frequency motors, and a whole lot of other stuff. As I said, this could be a lecture that would last hours instead of just minutes. Consider radical strategies for insulation, super insulation. All right, we had two building programs while I was teaching, one in the late 80s, one in the 90s, both in double digit millions. The first one, they put one inch of blue board insulation between the brick veneer and the load bearing concrete block wall. I looked with eagerness as energy costs went up to see what they would do with that second $24 million addition to our building, and they put one and a half inches of blue board insulation between the brick veneer and the load bearing wall. I made a comment and got called in for an informal superintendent's hearing because I said whoever approved this was an idiot. <laughs> my superintendent at that time was the one that approved it and did not like my comments. Again, I go back to 5 to 10% more in the building cost eliminates 80% or more of the heating and cooling demands on a building. And it wouldn't have taken anything. I taught architecture. I taught engineering in the schools. I did the math with the students. They were looking at me going, and by the way, they, they, the insulation was just loosely spaced between the brick and the concrete block wall. Um, using mass on the interior of a building to slow down the rate of heating and cooling, all right? Very cheap way of, of uh, balancing out your heating system, all right? Um, living roof systems, all right? Biomass heating systems. Edwards Knox and South Lewis are both classic examples. Edwards Knox, oh my gosh, you've got to get a tour of this place. If you haven't been there, the head maintenance guy there loves to show it off. It is a thing of beauty. They buy the wood chips locally. They get shoveled in with a front end loader or a shovel. It heats the building, the pool, all the outbuildings. It's a beautiful system that uses waste that usually just gets buried on the side of the road in that area. And renewable energy systems such as wind or solar for domestic hot water or photovoltaics for electricity. More things, share services between adjacent districts through technology. All this time, I keep hearing these guys bussing people back and forth. Oh my gosh, in the four years since I stopped teaching in the classroom, the whole new smart board thing has gone on. I went left with chalk and a chalkboard. And the whiteboards that we drew on with erasable magic markers were just coming in. 
And then my wife is telling me she just downloaded the notes that she wrote on the board to one of her students that missed a class, printed them out remotely, and handed them to the kid. And I'm going, wow. All right, but the same kind of thing. We look at this projector here. There is no reason we can't take the best of the best teachers and start to project their classroom lessons into multiple schools and use, I wouldn't call them a lower quality teacher, but more of a monitor for that room and then bring in teachers, and this would reduce the teaching cost as we uh, lose teachers due to attrition. All right, offer more extras such as AP classes and other college-bearing credit courses through distance learning techniques. It's being done with online universities. Why not just drop it down to the high school and grade school level eventually? Um, we were comparing Northport, which is on Long Island, which offers six foreign language options beginning in sixth or seventh grade to my school, which has gone from three language options to two language options, to a lot of the North Country schools only offering one foreign language option. All right, it's really hard to say you're from a great school if you're only speaking one foreign language at the students. The old joke that my wife likes to use is, you know, what do you call somebody that speaks three languages? Well, they're trilingual. What do you call somebody that speaks two languages? Well, they're bilingual. What do you call somebody that speaks one language? Oh, that's an American. <laughs> All right, petition the state for variations in graduation departments, seat time, credits, provide state aid on sharing core courses between uh, nearby school districts, and petition the state to eliminate that state tax cap or local tax cap. Radical strategies, ooh, here's where I started to get really creative and bat these around with friends and family. Change the school calendar. Extend the winter break to six weeks, shorten the summer break to six weeks. This is a European model. Uh, my wife and I travel to Germany every two years with up to 32 high school kids, 12 the last trip, and uh, this works for them. It, it keeps the heating curve and cooling curve to a minimum. Shorten the summer vacation to six weeks. Uh, change the school day and school week. Add two hours to a school day. Eliminate either a Monday or a Friday from the school week. Transfer the cost, or this transfers the cost to the parents in the form of childcare on days off. It's a sneaky way of sneaking a tax in that the parents won't notice. <laughs> All right, our populations are dropping. We've got these enormous buildings lease out, surplus school place to businesses, town municip municipal offices. Close inefficient schools, sell the facilities to businesses such as apartments for low income or elder care or to health care facilities. That's a growing trend in the area. I'm going to get more radical. Build smaller, more localized, more super efficient schools. Yes, in a way we'd be going back to the one room schoolhouse philosophy, but with advanced communication and instructional strategies. This eliminates that transportation. This eliminates that heating. This gives quality education through distance learning techniques. Home-based or home-based public school education strategies too. There is no reason other than testing and the true hands-on stuff that a kid actually has to come into the building. And I'm not eliminating the need for teachers. I'm using the teachers where they're most efficient. Uh, we could do email, Skyping, and similar emerging technologies. I can't keep up with all the stuff that my daughter keeps up with. She's 16. She's the one that programs my phone. Use the present school on a part-time basis for lab, group, and testing activities where you need the teachers. But the rest of this stuff, we're getting good. That was a little radical. Staff reduction through attrition. Since School staffing takes around 80% of the North Country school budgets. We could reduce the cost by developing a tiered system of teaching professionals with those at the peak of their teaching performance being used via advanced educational technology such as a virtual classroom to do the primary instruction and those not in that role become supervisory instructors. Staff benefits changes. Ooh, I did throw that one in. And again, it's things we have to think about when you think about the cost of these things. And that's it. <laughs> I left a lot of room for a lot of questions yes, later. All right, go right ahead. Are there questions right now? Or are we too uh, kind of overwhelmed? <laughs>
to get approval from state ed to put in a biomass heating plant, they won't approve them anymore. Why not? Because they cost about twice as much up front. It's the same argument you're telling me, but it's because the state is financing the building aid. They won't.